Good morning, everybody. Thank you. My name is Marek Malouš. I work as an academic worker and researcher at the Department of Psychology at the University of Ostrava in the Czech Republic. And I'm really, really very honored to, uh, that I was invited to come here to Portland and to share with you what we are actually doing in the Czech Republic. But before I start, I need to make a little introduction to my talk. Uh, it's quite different for me to talk here because I'm the only one who is going, who is going to speak completely only about chamber rest. And I think and I feel that there is so much to tell you that I'm sure I'm not going to make it in the 25 or maybe 30 minutes, which I have. I think it's a pity, but I hope you will understand it, that uh, if you don't understand something, uh, that we will have the chance to clarify it in the questions and answers session. And uh, maybe if uh, we won't make the entire presentation, that I will finish it in the qu questions and answers answer section then. So we have 78 more slides in front of us. So we'll come to it. And just in case some of you don't know where Czech Republic is, because it was the same with me about Portland and Oregon, <laughs> Let me show it to you. As you can see, Czech Republic is, a quite, is quite a small country just in the middle, in the heart of Europe. With its neighbors, Slovakia, Austria, Germany and Poland. In this eastern part of Czech Republic, uh, it is uh, an important place. There are Beskidi Mountains and uh, uh, it's important because this is a place uh, where is an area where it all has begun. And now we are ready to go through it. It was in 2006 and 2007 when I really felt very miserably and down. Once I came to a tea house called Good Tea House, and it was really good for me, because I found simple, see, only simple leaflet about a service called Dark Therapy. There wasn't much information on it, uh, I, but I knew nothing about it those days, but I immediately, immediately decided to undergo it uh, without uh, gathering any more information about it, which was quite unusual for me those days. Maybe even now. Well, all seven days spent during the dark therapy were very unusual for me. And to sum it up, it was very powerful and completely new experience. I won't, because I can't, tell you more now uh, I could talk about it for an hour. Maybe if you ask me later, maybe the next year, or definitely uh, if you come to Czech Republic to see and possibly to undergo it, you are welcome. What happened then? I talked about it, I was grateful to undergo it, and I considered it as a life-changing experience. But that was all from the academic perspective. And three years later, in the beginning on, of the second year of my doctoral studies, while hiking in the open air with my colleagues, I realized that I really want to make a research on this new service. One of the colleagues was Dr. Martin Kupka, and I want to name him because he's my best mate in researching the dark therapy, and majority of the research on dark therapy in the Czech Republic, we made together. The year two, uh, 2010 was the beginning of rest research in the Czech Republic. And without, what is mm, quite funny, without knowing it, and despite underestimation of others, I knew only the term dark therapy, which was and which is used by the public. And I knew, um, but I didn't find anybody who knew the term rest, whether flotation or chamber rest. So I thought we were starting perhaps a completely new research in the world, where we weren't. We weren't. And I realized it a few months afterwards. And 
uh, the underestimation of others. Uh, basically, some older colleagues knew something only about sensory deprivation, and they considered, considered is, it as a useless, weird, and sometimes as a possibly dangerous business. Even my supervisor of my doc doctoral studies thought about it, it was a nonsense. Actually, he said he thought it was a bullshit. <laughs> Nevertheless, he told to me, if you insist, do it. And he gave me the first money for starting the initial survey. And I really appreciate this attitude, and I'm really grateful to him for it. Now a little bit of general history of dark therapy. I'm not going to talk uh, about sensory deprivation or rest research history, but I will talk about how did it happen that something like this exists. Maybe you know Holger Kalweit, maybe some of you. Holger Kalweit uh, is a German ethnologist and psychologist who traveled around the world, and he found some practices or rituals when people went into an air environment with reduced stimulation. He was probably most influenced by a practice of Tibetan monks called Yangtik, which was a seven weeks long stay in a separate chamber with complete darkness, with food delivery and the guidance by an older and more experienced monk. He underwent it himself and imported it into Germany as the Dunkel therapy, which could be translated as the dark therapy. So Germany was the first place in Europe where to undergo a week-long stay or its multiples in a complete, in this, under these conditions. In uh, 2006, a similar service, not exactly the same, because um, um, it was independent, it, uh, it appear, appeared independently, started in the Czech Republic. There was only one provider with two chambers those days. The price was 16 American dollars per day for the whole service with food delivery, with the guidance. And as I had told before, I underwent it in 2007. I was perhaps the first psychologist and the youngest person who tried it those days. Nowadays, it's completely different. In, 2000, in 2010, when I started my research, there were several providers, around five, of dark therapy in the Czech Republic. I divided them into two types, as I will show you pictures uh, in a few moments. Type 1 includes all providers except one. The way they run the service where I, but mainly uh, they have a special, special wooden head or a brick chamber for it. Uh, the wooden head is mainly situated in their garden around, around the house they live in, and the brick chamber is mainly situated, or it's a part of their house which is uh, rebuilt for this use. Type 2 <laughs> includes the only one provider. Uh, but he is important because he is the only one who is uh, within a medical background and it is also the most, most comfortable place where you can undergo the service. And what more, he was the first provider who in 2010 agreed with researching the dark therapy and allowed me to do it at his place. Now, in 2015, there are around 15 providers of dark therapy in the Czech Republic. Czech Republic has uh, around 10 million inhabitants, only for information, with one, two, or three chambers. And also a few new are in Slovakia now. So we can see the number of providers is rapidly growing, and yet many of them are booked until the end of this year. And the most busy operator is the most comfortable, most expensive, and the only one within the medical area. Usually, it is booked more than a year in advance. I hope you are ready to see the pictures now, right? Uh, the type 1 dark therapy or rest chamber is situated in Kozlovice, which is a village in Beskidi Mountains. As you can see, this is the... Uh, easier way how to do it. It is a wooden head and it is situated in a beautiful nature. Mostly it is situated in a beautiful nature around it. Here's another view of the wooden head. And uh, here comes the interior. Uh, this provider has two chambers, so I will show you both chambers. You can see that the interior could vary 
but sim basically it is very similar. You have bathroom, you have the sink, you have the toilet, and sometimes you have a bidet. Uh, so this is the antechamber. This is not the main, uh, main chamber for staying there. This is the antechamber for do the necessary things. Here comes the main chamber. Mostly you can you can see an armchair, heating, ventilation system, shelves with some fruits, nuts, sometimes essential oils, sometimes only sometimes a CD or MP3 player, but it's not allowed in my research. The other chamber, also an armchair, black one, so you can't see it properly. Sometimes exercise device, shelves again, heating again. And finally, the bed. The bed is very, really important for the stay. And that's all from the, uh, from the interior for, uh, for the main room. And as you can see, it is not only a lovely place, but you can also meet amazing people around these wooden heads. This tall man is the operator of the dark therapy service in Kozlovice. Uh, his name is Roman Barták, and I also, I'm also showing him and his place because he's the second provider who allowed me to make a research uh, at his, in his facility. I hope I don't have to introduce you to this honorable and likable man. This is his wife, this lovely uh, uh, lady, it's his wife, wife Phyllis. And I don't know why, but the bald-headed man on the left, it's me. Well, it was enough for the peaceful and quiet place in Kozlovice. And now we are ready to move to the dark therapy rest chamber type 2, which is actually only a few, kilome few kilometers far from the first place I showed to you. This is the second type, the only facility of its kind in the Czech Republic. It's uh, within uh, Beskidi Rehabilitation Center Čeladná. It's also a village in Beskidi Mountains. It's famous for, uh, for its golf course. And to understand it well, the rehabilitation center means that it's, uh, it works with uh, physically impaired people, like physiotherapy, something like spa. It's not for mental... Uh, mental disorders or cognitive impairments. So this is the, it's called Villa Matma, in translation, something like Mind Dark. Another view, uh, another, another view of the, this apartment, of this chamber, and now you can see the floor plan. Uh, and as you can see, you, uh, you can enter the apartment from the front porch uh, via two separate entrance doors. Here's the antechamber, inaccessible technical room for um, the, the customers, for the uh, people who are staying in the dark. This is their main room, a corridor to a cloakroom, to a toilet and a bathroom. Now I will show you it on the pictures. So the two separately locked uh, front doors with a pre anti or maybe anti anti chamber a really small one, then the real empty chamber where the food is delivered. Also, there's a, there's, there, are, there is beverage, there is water. This is the inaccessible technical room. Uh, you can see in the technical room very sophisticated recuperation unit uh, for the entire facility. Here you can see the bathroom. And finally, the main room. Again, uh, there's a bed, there's a comfortable armchair, some exercise f uh, devices, some shelves. What you can't see here is a table with some papers. And here it's a wooden computer with exactly seven marbles in each line. And you can guess why exactly seven marbles in each line. Uh, here we can see the way the therapist visit can be performed, of course, under complete darkness. And here's another picture, more up-to-date, where is a new bed, which is uh, more white, more comfortable. And also a couple stay was carried out uh, there. And 
it was a honeymoon for newlyweds. And what more is important uh, above the table, it's a communication device, it's one-way one -way phone. Uh, nobody is allowed to call inside the apartment, but uh, you can, uh, 24 hours a day, call or reach your guide, the nurses or a um, doctor. You can also try to imagine your own stay, lying and being in the complete darkness for minutes, hours, days, maybe one week, maybe more. Uh, this is Dr. Andrew Urbish, who is running the facility in Beskidi Rehabilitation Center. And I want to show him because he was the first who allowed me to do the research and uh, because he the most important operator and propagator of the dark therapy in the Czech Republic. And here we can see him just after completing his seven weeks long stay during January and February 2011. To sum the introdu introduction to the dark therapy up, it is a procedure or service which you pay for it, you stay usually one week or it's multiples, it's a place of absolute darkness, a place of silence and solitude, but not necessarily absolute soli uh, silence and solitude. It's a safe, cozy, cozy and comfortable place where food is provided, sanitary facilities and a daily consultation with your guide or therapist is included. And how is it organized? Again, daily food delivery, daily guide or visit uh, or therapist visit if you want so. If you don't want so, you don't have to. And sometimes you can order some special activities, for example, in the Beskidi Rehabilitation Center, where you have pain in your back, uh, you can order a Thai massage, for example, again, in the complete darkness. And for some urgent situations, you can call for help. It's not available for all the providers, but uh, at the Beskidi Rehabilitation Center, it's available all the time, or you can quit. Mainly you are locked because of safety, but of course you have the key, every time you have the key, to unlock the door and to, uh, to quit it. And you have a plenty of time for yourse yourself. Really plenty of time. So what is allowed or enabled inside? You can sleep, you can meditate, you can open the door of your imagination. You can think or not think. You can lie, sit, walk, exercise, dance, sing, play some instrument if you have some. You can be silent, whisper, talk, shout, scream, yell, cry. You can be calm, relaxed, anxious, angry, sad, grateful, regretful, happy, excited, bored, or just be. You can, of course, eat and shower. All of these, and probably much more, you are allowed or enabled to do or not to do during your week-long stay. Simply, it's about turning your attention inward to your body and mind, and for some people, to their soul and spirit. And what is not allowed or enabled inside? To phone, browse, Google, mail, chat, play games, watch TV, read a book, to shop, Really try imagine not to use this for the whole week or maybe for a longer longer time. And not only that you are not allowed to, but because you really don't need to. And even this. Not for the whole week. You are you aren't allowed to meet people, debate, pretend, manipulate, lose face. You can't escape via drugs via addictive behavior or neurotic behavior. Of course, exceptions are everywhere. Everybody can cheat if he, if he wants to. But basically, it's not as simple as in normal life to turn our attention outwards to other things, to other people and uh, the uh, outer situations. So what is it good for the dark therapy? What do you think? It's good for relaxation, for calm down, shutdown or restart. It's good for planning, 
re reviewing, revising, reassessing, for clarifying, for new inspiration. And also, you can, you can perceive it as a rite of passage, which can have different forms. Sometimes it can be quite um, scary and adventurous, but still it's a very safe way how to do uh, your own rite of passage. You can also use the time from, for, um, for feeling and thinking about yourself, about uh, your self-concept, self-evaluation, self-acceptance. Self you, you can also think about what other people's, how other people perceive you, and how do you perceive other people, and how do you feel in your relationships. And you can maybe reconsider some uh, your, of your relationships also. You have the time for thinking about your work, about your life, about the past, present and future, because you have a, you have a really huge moment of now, really huge, huge moment of now for that. And uh, it is really wonderful, and, or what I think that is wonderful, uh, when you are able to integrate all the material which comes to your mind, either by yourself, or by, on your own, or with the help of your guide or the therapist. You can see it also as a diet or detoxification, but uh, mostly psychical, also physical, but uh, this is mostly about the psychical detoxification. And when you think that you are lost in your life, that you need a more serenity or balance into your life. If you need to center yourself, find your life direction and more, you can try the dark therapy. And now, I'm not, I don't want to claim that all these happen when you are in the dark therapy. This, these are only examples which are much more easier to do it during the dark therapy than in the normal life. And these are the examples uh, from my own, my own experience, from the experience of other people who underwent it. But again, it's not that uh, it will be like this and uh, you, you will reach everything you want to from the stay. Uh, to simplify it, you can perceive it as, a, as an art of rest, because you have, a, you have one week long for resting yourself or you can perceive it as a, as a more complex restart of yourself, of your life, for example. Now, is it a therapy or not? Well, it is difficult to say it positively. Uh, the term diet therapy is not scientifically appropriate, but the whole context of the diet therapy could be used therapeutically. Many people consider it, consider it as a treatment or self-treatment. And I consider it as a special place and space suitable for therapeutic process, which enables, effects and catalyzes our ability to get more in touch with both our consciousness and unconsciousness, or the conscious and unconscious part of ourself. Is it a, do is it a new discovery or not? No. It was there since time immemorial from uh, Donald Hepp, John Peter Zubek, John C. Lilly, Peter Sutfeld, Erid Barabash, Tom Fine and others, we knew about sensory deprivation and rest research. But when two do the same, it's not the same. Uh, it is different context and settings, different kind of people, different motivation, their inner, inner motivation, different philosophy, religion or uh, spiritual background, uh, different intention of the providers. So, again, it is hard to say it positively. Both no and yes. And now, I would like to share a little bit of results uh, with you, but I'm not sure whether we have time for it. Okay, we have some more time for it. Great. The initial and first survey uh, I did, it was until 2015, and I collected data from uh, 37 dark therapy customers which spent the whole week in the dark therapy. Uh, I used self-reporting questionnaires and inventories, 
like existence scale, five facets, mindfulness questionnaire, Rosenberg self-esteem scale, and the symptom checklist 90, which is a psychiatric tool. Because we don't, know, we don't have time for go through the methodology and the statistics uh, step by step and to discuss things like uh, how is it possible and uh, uh, what other uh, interactions could, could be there, I only sum it up that we found significant, let's say, improvement, even though I, I'm not, it's not scientifically correct or appropriate, we found a significant improvement among all categories. Uh, we collected the data before the stay and three weeks after the stay. Uh, now, results of the second data collection, which hasn't been finished yet. I started this uh, quasi-experimental study in 2015. I, uh, there were 40 participants from, uh, from the university, it was college students, and uh, the length of the stays were two or three days. I used, uh, or we used, battery of cognitive performance tests and physiological measure measurements, thanks to the Department of Physiology and Pathophysiology of uh, the University of Ostrava. And we, measure, we measured data like EK, EKG and HRV. Because the group, uh, control group data will be collected after the autumn 2015, so I can't tell you the results now. I hope it seems to be promising, but I can't tell you now. And uh, to the future, the third and the others data collection. I would like to make a quasi-experimental study in 2016 uh, with longer length of the stay, with four or five days uh, long stay. And I would like to measure uh, what, you, what, what, I, what I told before, and I would like to add uh, measuring mindfulness again and burnout syndrome. And uh, uh, as for the health benefits, I would like to continue in measuring EKG and HRV, then to add blood pressure, uh, weight, um, uh, uh, yeah, weight reduction, because um, I assume that there will be a, a weight reduction, because it, it, is, it is shown that it is like that during the week-long stays. And if I have uh, money for it, because that's always a matter of money, if I have money for it, I would like to measure this uh, secretion of hormones like cortisol and melatonin, and possibly EEG in the future, maybe fMRI, who knows. Uh, oh, I would like to, but again, it's about the money. And the following studies, then I would like, like to skip to s again to seven days long stays, and to measure the psychological and therapeutical benefits and addictive behavior, and again, the health benefits as above. So, in a preliminary conclusion, dark therapy is a special modification of chain breast. Still, it's quite controversial. Some people don't like it at all. Uh, I, I really think that it could be used as a therapeutic tool where the role of the provider, the guide, the therapist, I'm not really sure about the proper, proper English word for it, so that's why I'm using all these terms. But the role of the provider guide therapist is not very clear is not very clear yet, but it seems to be very important. I perceive the hunger of people for dark therapy stays as a life tempo barometer, like a pendulum or mandala, when you are too much in uh, into something, in uh, in extreme of something, then you tend to do the exact opposite. And dark therapy is the exact opposite of the, of the speed, uh, speedness of today's life. And I hope it could be also uh, beneficial for dealing with civilization diseases. At least uh, the prevention and possibly the cure. But it is definitely a matter of further research. What is important, uh, I'm aware that uh, there is much, much to do in front of us. But uh, important is that the first steps have already been done. The very first steps, it was the sensory deprivation and rest research decades ago, and the, the new first steps for the last five years. 
Thank you for your attention. And if you want to join, support, or collaborate with us, please let me know. Thank you.